2020 has been quite the year. Between the pandemic and social unrest, Americans of every age are facing the mental health consequences of this uncertain era. Today's guest warns that those concerns are not just limited to adults, but shared with children and adolescents as well. She's Dr. Guyani Da Silva, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me, as he always does in the co-host chair, is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, storytellers, novelists, journalists, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping the United States today. This week, we're joined by Dr. Guyani Da Silva, a child and adolescent psychiatrist joining us today from California. Guyani, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, good morning, Jim and Wayne. I'm so happy to be here with you guys. Thank you. There's a lot that we want to get into with you today, but I wanted to start sort of at a 30,000 foot level and really sort of talk to you about why is mental health uh, such an important part of the conversation when we're talking about health in general? Oh my gosh. So what I like to say is that there is no health without mental health. There's no way to separate out mental health for just some people. It's really a part of everybody's general sense of health, general sense of well being, and we need to pay attention to it just like we pay attention to our physical health. So, I, as, as I understand it, there's been a lot of progress uh, in the last uh, couple of decades about the link between uh, neuroscience and psychiatry. Uh, am, am I right in that understanding? Absolutely. The, brain is central to psychiatry. It's a mix of neuroanatomy, developing pathways, and psychology. But the psychology really manifests by these pathways that are developed in the brain and sections of the brain that develop and then communicate with each other in order to really uh, determine how we manage emotions, how we manage our behavior, how we manage interpersonal relationships. So those pathways develop at different stages of, of life, beginning really with gestation and then infancy. And yes, you've, you've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of research, and certainly a lot of uh, speaking and writing about that. Talk, talk about the stages starting, starting with gestation, of how the brain develops, and then we can get into influences that would be negative and influences that would be positive. So that was sure. a mouthful, but let's go through it. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. But um, so, you know, when the embryo is developing, it starts out with just one or two cells and then they divide and then they transform and they create the brain. And so when the child is born, they have this rudimentary brain. And so the midbrain, which is the bottom part of the brain that kind of sits just above your neck, that part of the brain develops first. And it's critical for physiological life. So if, um, monitors and regulates breathing, eating, all the physiological stuff that goes on in the physical body. But as the child, as the infant grows and is stimulated by both genetics and nurture, this is the nature and nurture um, situation, as they are stimulated by their environment as babies, then different parts of the brain start to grow. I mean, there is a template, but they really develop with stimulation from the environment. For instance, infants, um, when they're with their caregiver or their mom or their dad and they're, whole, they're being held and the mom is looking at the child, that is a connection that's being made. It's an attachment and bonding, which stimulates the brain to grow as well. And so as they get a little bit older and they're stimulated by colors and their visual system develops and their auditory systems develop and they learn how to speak and then they learn how to walk. So all these activities that are very physical do impact the brain. It's, it's a kind of a um, very nice cycle where the brain develops, allows for these activities to happen. And then as they're challenged, as they fall, as they feel things that hurt or are cold or hot, that also stimulates the brain to develop pathways 
and the nervous system to develop and the systems in your brain to develop. And that happens throughout life. So even with uh, education, academics, that all stimulates different parts of the brain to grow too. It, it stimulates higher cortical functions to grow. So now, what, are, hmm? what are some of the positive influences in this, this growth curve that, that begins in infancy and continues into adulthood? And then we're gonna get into uh, childhood and, and adolescence, which are your specialties, positive influences. So positive influences. So there was a, a Dr. Greenspan talked about floor time and the first year. So from like zero to three months, bonding, attachment, uh, holding the child, looking at the child, cooing with the baby, making faces, having them mimic you. All of that is positive for the child. It stimulates the limbic system to grow. It stimulates all of the brain um, activities to grow to understand stimuli from the environment. Um, those are all positive things in the infancy period of time. And then as they grow, you know what, um, walking, stumbling helps the balance system grow, the proprioception uh, systems grow in the brain. So um, some of the positive things to do for children is to allow them to fail, allow them to stumble, allow them to make mistakes because they'll learn from it, not just cognitively, but actually at a neurotomical level, um, neuroanatomical level, the brain will grow and they will um, learn from that challenge. What, 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 I'm so curious. So the flip side of that, what are the what are the negatives that uh, that can negatively influence the, the the development of the human brain? So some of the negative things are kind of the obvious stuff, like abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect. So kids really need a lot of nurturance and validation. All and and, and those those actually produce physical changes in the brain. They do absolutely. In fact. Uh, trauma can actually stop brain development. So Dr. Bruce Perry has done a lot of work in this um, field and he has actually shown he can map the brain and basically tell you exactly where uh, trauma has occurred because they're, they're very specific places, depending on what time and what the trauma is that actually stops and halts brain development. Wow. So the, the environment is also a critical factor and looking at negative influences, if, for example, you live in a violent neighborhood, yeah. that's very different for a child who's living in a, a neighborhood where you don't walk out the front door and, and there might be might have been a shooting or there are drugs being dealt. Yeah. The, the environment in terms of, of the physical environment, if you're living close to, you know, an old chemical plant or an old coal plant, and, and you can go through a long list. Talk about that because that certainly has a profound impact. Uh, on development of the brain. Absolutely. You're talking about adverse child experiences that our Surgeon General in California is a big proponent of, uh, of that. They, uh, she really wants us to understand. So uh, economic status of so poverty can impact brain development. Um, any sort of adverse effect like uh, losing housing or having insecure housing can cause a lot of anxiety in children. Um, any kind of abuse, violence, like you mentioned. So living in a um, community where safety is a huge concern, racism is also a huge uh, negative influence on kids as they grow up. Um, anything that really impacts safety, impacts uh, basic needs. So um, nutrition, so poor nutritional status can also uh, impact brain development. Um, Things like uh, moving around and needing to move around because of safety issues or poverty issues or running from the law, that kind of thing can also impact the stability and development of resiliency in children. And they can actually develop uh, something like post-traumatic stress disorder because of these um, environmental factors. So post-traumatic stress disorder is high anxiety, um, hypervigilance, not really being able to see the future, not feeling connected to other people, um, having flashbacks, having poor sleep, having mood problems as well. So these are not transitory issues. These have these can have a lifelong impact because again, the brain in its development, getting these negative influences changes. So talk about that. This isn't like you 
suddenly at the age of 21 move out of the, the neighborhood that was violent or whatever, and then everything is copacetic. That's not how it works. No, that's not how it works. So like, imagine you are a rower and you wanna join the Olympic rowing team and somebody comes by and chops off both your arms. Is it impossible to make it to the rowing team? Not impossible, but gosh, it's really going to be hard to do that, right? So that's what these events are like. It's, it's really just um, changes the brain so that it doesn't develop fully. So the brain develops according to what is stimulated. So we all have different genes. We have some genes that are beneficial to us, some genes that aren't beneficial to us. And it does give a template or a blueprint for how the brain is gonna develop. So all humans have a certain blueprint for the brain, but how the walls are built uh, in that blueprint, how the systems, how the different parts of the brain uh, grow, whether they grow larger or smaller or don't grow at all, or how they make connections from one side to the other, or how efficient the brain is in making connections, um, all depends on how it's stimulated. So if it's stimulated by negative influences, it's going to not develop those pathways. I know you. I know you spend a lot of time uh, thinking and working with students uh, or students with with teenagers, uh, the thirteen and up. Uh, why is that period so important in the development of the brain? Oh, it's super critically important because there are parts of the brain that finish their development or maturation. Of course, the the brain is still plastic, and we're learning um, beyond that. But they mature during thirteen and twenty seven. And those parts of the brain are the limbic system, and that's a system that regulates and manages emotions. So you learn how to cope through the limbic system, learn how to have your anger, sadness, uh, happiness, joy, all of that is uh, regulated by the limbic system. And then you have your reward system also develops. So this is critical because between 13 and 27, uh, a lot of kids and young adults do experiment with alcohol and drugs, but the reward system, making connections with the limbic system, uh, really puts people at a high risk for developing addictions because addic addictive substances and appetitive activities do influence the uh, way the reward system works and how dopamine, because that's our feel good neurotransmitter, how dopamine is modulated in the brain. So for instance, if you take alcohol or drugs, it will give a huge rise in dopamine in the brain. And so between 13 and 27, the brain then gets calibrated to need that high dopamine to feel good or to feel relaxed instead of a moderate rise in dopamine that we get from doing well on an exam or having friendships or playing in, a, in sports or getting an award or getting a hug from your mom or dad. Um, so. That's really critical. And then there are the systems of memory and then the prefrontal cortex, which is critically important because the prefrontal cortex is what helps people think in very sophisticated ways to so strategize and use data, assimilate it, understand it, make connections between the higher functions of the brain and the lower parts of the brain as well. So it helps uh, basically synthesize and modulate and use the limbic system, the reward system, memory, your visual systems, your auditory, your sensory, all parts of the brain into uh, thinking critically, thinking with strategy, thinking with intelligence. Uh, so that prefrontal cortex is critically important to develop. So needless to say, we are not living in quote unquote normal times. We're living during a pandemic we're living during a, a time of great economic suffering and, and depression. And in the middle of all this, depending on where you are in the country, uh, what region, what state, what city, uh, kids are gonna be going back to school in some fashion or another. Th this must be an issue that comes up all the time with, with your employer, with your work. Talk about that. This is unprecedented and it would seem to me quite clear that, that the challenges here are extraordinary in terms of the mental health of, of kids. Yeah, so one thing to remember when we think about our kids going back to school and dealing with the stress pandemic 
and all the changes that they have to contend with is that they're thinking differently than adults do. They cope differently than adults. So until about 15 or 16, kids think in pretty concrete ways. After about 16, 17, 18, they develop the ability to think in abstract ways. So what that means is most adults think in abstract ways. So we're able to see a lot of different options and we're able to uh, anticipate issues. We're able to cope better with stress than kids who are in their younger teen years because those teens think very concretely. So if it's not one way, then it's gotta be another way. They don't really see three or four or five options. So what parents need to do to help them with this, um, with this uh, issue is to help them cope by talking through feelings, asking them, what do you anticipate for school to start? Um, you're gonna be starting online, well, however it is that they're gonna be starting. What do you think will be, what, what do you think it'll be like? What do you think day one will be like? What are you going to do? Are you going to wear a new outfit? Do you know what you're going to wear? Do you have a backpack? Do you have all your books together? Um, get a couple of new school supplies, get some new clothes. This is a new school year and kids are enthusiastic and it's a big deal for them. Every school year is huge for children and for teenagers. So treat it like it is a new year, even though we might as adults be disappointed that they're not gonna have the same experience that we had. Kids are extremely resilient. One of the things that, so we're taping this in, uh, in, in late August, uh, and colleges and universities are, are headed back. Uh, some have already had students on campus, and they've uh, you know they've opened with very few cases of COVID on campus, but in a matter of weeks. And the the story that's emerging is that it's it's students having you know going to parties. They've been cooped up with mom and dad for six months, and now they've got that first taste of freedom, and they're doing what kids do. Uh, was there any way around that particular course of of, of adolescent behavior? Or young adult behavior? You know, that's that's a, a very difficult situation for adolescents because adolescents do have this idea of invincibility, that it's not going to happen to them. And even if it does happen to them, they really feel like they're going to survive it and it won't be that bad. And really, that's the message that we have been getting, although there are conflicting reports and people are getting quite sick, uh, even in the younger ages, even, even children are getting quite sick. So it's um it's really helping them balance that the facts and what's going on and then having them make their own decision for their own safety um i think we're going to have to tolerate some risk taking because that's what kids and adolescents do it's part of what they're supposed to do uh, their big task of development is to separate and individuate from their families and which might mean rejecting um, values and good advice sage advice from uh, their elders, uh, but they're supposed to do that. So they're going to have to come uh, up with their own strategy for being safe. And so what parents can do is to gently talk through all the different options. So kind of ask them, hey, what do you think about the situation? You're going back to school. There's this pandemic going on. COVID is so, uh, so contagious. Uh, how do you think you might deal with that as you go back to school? How do you think you might make a choice of whether to go to a party or not. Do you think that there might be other kids who have COVID or other uh, young adults who have COVID? And, and how are you gonna keep yourself safe? So ask the questions that they might not be thinking about, not necessarily giving them the answers. I wouldn't give them the answers, but I would discuss it with them respectfully, gently. And if there's any information you do wanna give them, pose it like a question. So looking, looking at younger children, how frank should the conversations be that parents and guardians and caregivers have with young kids regarding regarding coronavirus, the risk of it? I mean, certainly they know that people are dying of it. Talk about that. What advice would you give parents? And I'm, I'm talking, you know, children maybe in elementary school, early high school, or even in high school. How frank? Well, I, should... I, I would be pretty frank and transparent. Um, I would let the child guide how much information to give. So I would ask them, what are you thinking about? What have you heard? Have you heard about this pandemic? What have you seen in the news? What have you seen on YouTube? What are you and your friends doing? What worries you? How do you feel about this? And then respond 
to those questions. And if they say, oh, I hear that, you know, my friend Johnny, his grandmother died of COVID and I really don't want you to get it. I'm afraid that you, know, you, you might get COVID and die. So that, that's a very real fear that kids are having that their parents, the people they rely on might get COVID and might get very, very sick or might even die. So I would be pretty frank about that and say, you know, we're taking all the precautions that we can. We don't know, life is uncertain, but we definitely want to be protective of ourselves. We wanna be there for you. Um, we're gonna be safe, we're gonna keep you safe. Um, the chances of us getting COVID are very low because we're in quarantine and we're staying at home and we're not communicating with other people. We're not touching people, we're wearing a mask. We're you know, not touching things that everybody else is touching. We're not going to public places right now. And it's kind of a drag, but um, it's going to keep us safe. You know, you, you mentioned earlier sort of the, the impact of trauma on the development of the brain. And I, I think about this period just in my own personal life so, since since March. There have been sort of some days have been better than others. There have been some days where it just feels like Groundhog Day every day for six months. And it's the, it's, the repetition is... Uh, I think Michelle Obama said recently sort of fed a a low grade depression that just sort of permeates everything. So for the adults uh, who've got children in their lives, uh, you know, what 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 do we do as parents, as caregivers uh, to make sure that the, the stuff that's affecting us doesn't harm our kids any more than just these circumstances are going to in general? These are very stressful times, and it is a big task for parents to help their kids, but it doesn't have to be that difficult. So um, I ask my parents whenever the family is going through something uh, stressful, like a divorce or moving or losing a job or financial stress, and the pandemic is to be transparent, is to give an example for children of how to cope. So what I would do is parents express yourself to your kids, let them know this is a really stressful time for me. I'm having kind of a hard day and I'm feeling a little bit irritable. I, I don't know what's going on, but I think it's part of the stress. I'm feeling a lot of stress inside of me. Um, I wonder if you feel the same way. I wonder if you feel stressful too some days. And I gotta tell you, I think that I need to take some time for myself to help decrease this level of stress that I'm feeling in this this kind of crankiness that I have. So I'm going to take a walk. That always helps me feel a little bit better if I get a little exercise and I get rid of some of this anxious energy. And I'm wondering if you would like to come with me. Uh, maybe I'll take the dog with me too, because I bet the dog would like to get out um, and, and take a walk and then uh, you know, just breathe in the fresh air. And that might help me feel a little bit better. Uh, if you'd like to come with me, I'd love for you to join me. But if they don't, that's fine. Uh, go for your walk and come back and let them know how the walk was. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I went on that walk. I feel a little bit better. I can get back to my computer and I can do my work. Um, and, and that really helped me cope. So be you me. have, Guyana, you have a, a, a podcast with a co-host uh, and been looking at it and it seems to be quite popular. It's called Chat and Chai. You get into a lot of issues there. Some are directly psychiatric as it were, some are not. You you had a recent podcast, a candid conversation on racism, which of course is very timely in the wake of, of the killing of George Floyd. What did you get into in that podcast or, or in general, what conversations should people be having about racism today in, in America? Well, racism is everywhere. It's not just in America, it's in all uh, populations all over the world, some kind of racism, unfortunately, um, the darker your skin is, the more uh, disenfranchised and the more marginalized and the more devalued people are. And racism, I think, is something that we all need to talk about and that we should not um, avoid or think that we don't have because everybody has it. We're conditioned, like, like we said earlier about the brain developing patterns depending on the environment. So when you're in an environment where uh, there is racism and there are these very subtle um, uh, jokes, statements that people make that they may not even realize is racist, but they repeat it. And then kids learn that they start to believe that those ideas are real. And so they grow up with these conditioned ideas and then those conditioned ideas turn into behaviors 
and decisions and um, and the way that they interact with other people. So racism, looking at our own racist racist thoughts, monitoring ourselves, regulating ourselves, I think is really really important. So not just thinking about how our brain develops, but also how our psyches develop and how we're influencing our children's brain development and conditioned thoughts is really important for parents to consider. And having frank conversations, I, I'm, I'm totally for having these honest, open, transparent conversations with children, uh, challenging belief systems, challenging the status quo openly with your children in a gentle, non-judgmental, accepting way and asking them, what do you think about this? I mean, my child who's 14, when all of this was going on with, with all the protests and their protests in my own town, um, he asked me, like, why, are, why are people protesting? I don't understand. What's the point of protesting? And I said, well, the point is to express yourself, number one. And number two, um, it is to express yourself in a big group so that the message gets across that there are a lot of people who feel and think in a similar way. And that gives a message not only to the people who are protesting and not only to our public officials, but also to the community that, hey, look, there are people here who think differently than what the status quo is. And let's challenge this status quo. Let's look at our own belief system. Let's let's challenge and let's think about what we can do. And is it really a fair way to think? Is it equitable? Does it help other people? Does it help me? Really, to think in racist ways inhibits us. It narrows our thinking. It narrows our options. It uh, creates barriers to creating relationships with people. It creates barriers to moving forward and expanding, and uh, even from an economical point of view, from a psychological point of view, from a personal point of view. You know, racism is, is not helpful. You know, Dr. Uh, Guyani Da Silva, that is a great place for us to leave it. Thank you so much for being with us today. That's all the time we have this week. For Wayne, I'm Jim. We hope you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.